everyone. How's it going? Kevin here with Push to Talk. Uh, it is 10 o'clock here, my time. I just got finished watching uh, this week's episode of Dark Side of the Ring uh, about Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling, FMW. Um, I didn't think I was going to sit down and record a video tonight, which seems to be a trend here. Uh, I think I do this a lot with a lot of my videos. I don't think I'm going to record one night. I tell myself, hey, I'm going to chill and play video games tonight. But inevitably, I end up sitting down and recording a video anyway, uh, because I'm just always thinking about wrestling. So tonight's episode of Dark Side of the Ring, and, and mind you, I'm probably not going to do any other Dark Side of the Ring uh, type episodes unless there's something that really inspires me to create a video, but I really wanted to do a video about tonight's episode because it was uh, about FMW, uh, which, you know, to me was kind of a a pretty, pretty formative promotion for me uh, in my pro wrestling fandom. Um, you know, growing up, uh, I was always a WCW kid. I started watching the WWE after, uh, the buyout and, uh, you know, I wasn't always super in love with what I watched with WWE, you know, deep down inside, I was always hoping for some kind of alternative. Uh, but around the age of like, I must've been maybe 15, maybe 14 or 15 or something like that. Uh, my parents took me to Rob Van Dam's five-star comic book store in uh, Lakewood, California. Um, it must have been in, you know, the, the early-ish 2000s uh, when they took me there. And I was a big RVD fan uh, at that time. Uh, I loved RVD and Kane and the tag team they had back then. And uh, I was, I remember going to his shop and uh, checking out the DVD section uh, that he had there. And, and mind you, uh, this was at a time where the internet really isn't what it is today. Like, we didn't have this little thing called YouTube back then. So it was kind of hard to discover new wrestling. Um, you know, and when it did, it just kind of happened organically for me. I was never into tape trading or anything like that. I was pretty secluded in my wrestling fandom back then. So when I found something new, uh, I would get really excited about it and really, really latch on to it, right? So, so let's rewind. Let's look at me, you know, 14, 15 year old me in RVD's comic book store looking at the DVDs. And as I'm looking through... I see a DVD with uh, Cactus Jack on the front of it. And, you know, Cactus Jack, uh, Mick Foley, was someone that I really, really liked uh, growing up. Um, I remember buying one of his, his book, uh, the, uh, the Mankind book, uh, from some, like, thrift store uh, as a kid. I read the thing cover to cover uh, as a young kid, and I absolutely loved it. I became so, like enamored with the idea of Cactus Jack and enamored with the idea of like violent and deathmatch wrestling. Uh, my only exposure to that kind of stuff was what we would see on WWE TV at that time, uh, which, you know, granted they could do some pretty uh, hardcore stuff back then. I mean, you know, you think of the TLC matches, uh, you think of like the, um, some of the, th the rare thumbtack spots they did. Uh, and going back even further, you look at Foley and Hell in a Cell. You know, I had seen all of that stuff um, up until this this point. So I always had an interest in really, really violent wrestling. And I really, really liked Cactus Jack because of that. So as I'm looking through these DVDs in RVD's comic book store in Lakewood, California, I see a DVD with Cactus Jack on the front of it. I was like, oh, sweet, dude, it's Mick Foley. Let's check this out. So I pull it off the shelf, and I look at it, and it says uh, FMW King of the Deathmatch on the, on the cover of it. And the cover is just this shocking thing. You see Mick Foley's face, you know, he's missing his teeth. You see, like, flames and explosions in the background. And <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, as a 15, 16-year-old kid, what on earth am I even looking at? What is FMW? What is this, like going on with Cactus Jack slash slash Mick Foley? Like I had no idea he even wrestled in Japan at, at that point, let alone wrestled in this promotion called FMW. So I grab the DVD, I uh, bring it over to my mom and dad. Is like, hey, can can we buy this? And them being like super awesome parents, we're just like, yeah, sure. Like let's get it, let's check it out. Uh, 
you know, they, they never uh, force me to shy away from any kind of, like, violent movies or wrestling or video games or anything like that. They were always, like, really open to letting me experience that stuff growing up. Um, you know, with the understanding that it was all fake, uh, of course. So when they saw this DVD on the shelf and I brought it up to them, they're like, yeah, sure. They, you know, if you want it, let's get it. Let's get it for you. Yeah. There son. Um, so I bought this DVD, um, with me and my brother and we get back to our, uh, the motor home, right? We, we used to travel a lot as kids. So, um, we spent a lot of time, uh, in the motor home, just going on vacations and, that kind of stuff. So we get back, and I plug this thing in, and I watch it for the first time, my brother and I, and we just can't believe what we are seeing. Uh, I had no idea what to expect as a kid when I plugged this thing in, and, you know, the first couple of matches were cool, uh, Japanese-style matches. Uh, we had some hardcore stuff in there, but the first match uh, that, like, totally blew me away uh was of course the cactus jack versus uh wing kanemura match uh in the like half of the ring was barbed wire ropes and on the other side it was like a pit of glass with barbed wire running over it and i was like terrified watching this as a kid i was terrified and captivated at the same time part of me was like should i even be watching this am i even allowed to be watching this but at the same time, this is awesome. And this is, like, so violent and captivating and cool. And it's Mick Foley or Cactus Jack. I couldn't get enough of it. Um, I had to watch it a couple of times just to kind of wrap my head around what I was seeing. I, you know, up until that point, the most extreme thing I ever saw was, like, I don't know, uh, the Foley off the cell, maybe. Or Foley going into the thumbtacks bothered me even more for some reason uh, as a kid. Uh, so when I saw this, I was just like, dude, floored. I couldn't believe what was going on until I saw the next match on that DVD, which was an exploding barbed wire death match. One of the ones where they had a countdown and the entire ring explodes at the end of it. Uh, I believe this match was a tag match. Uh, it was Hayabusa and Masato Tanaka versus Terry Funk and Mr. Pogo. Um... And I distinctly remember in that match, like, Mr. Pogo, he had his, like, hand scythe thing, and he's just carving in the head of uh, Tanaka, and it, I just found it so disturbing. It, that just freaked me out, almost more than the glass and the thumbtacks and the explosions and the barbed wire. That just freaked me out. I didn't even know how to comprehend uh, what I was seeing, but I thought it was so awesome and so, so cool. You know, that's why I think as an adult, I have such an appreciation for deathmatch wrestling now is because of this crazy FMW stuff I saw as a kid from just buying a random DVD from RVD's comic book store. So little did I know uh, what FMW was <laughs> or, you know, the legend of FMW. Um, I had no idea that it was this crazy huge, you know, in the early 80s or late 80s, early 90s, crazy huge uh, Japanese wrestling promotion. Um, but, you know, I found that out later <laughs> as an adult when I thought to just look up FMW and, you know, and then ended up buying all the FMW DVDs that I could have find and then watching all of them. Um, so, you know, I was really, really excited to see that we were going to get a Dark Side of the Ring episode about uh, FMW. You know, all I really knew about FMW up to this point was just strictly the stuff about the matches um, and the violence. Um, I had no idea the crazy story behind this promotion. Um, you know, for example, in this episode of Dark Side of the Ring, when they were talking about the involvement of the Yakuza in FMW and how the Yakuza would run the arenas and they would have to pay the Yakuza to run stores, shows in those arenas, I thought that was crazy. Like, when Sabu talks about, um, you know, being warned not to wrestle near a certain section of the, uh, 
crowd because that's where the Yakuza sat. Um, you know, that was pretty crazy to begin with, but the fact that they actually went into that section and the Yakuza tried to beat up, or did successfully beat up Sabu because of it, um, I had no idea. You know, <laughs> when I think Yakuza, I think of the Yakuza games. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously they're a real life thing, but I didn't know they actually had ties to pro wrestling, let alone FMW. So I thought that was a really cool aspect of the episode that I'd never known anything about before. Um, another thing that I liked about that episode is when Chris Jericho is talking about the, um, Onita versus Terry Funk, uh, exploding barbed wire death match, um, and that how, like, he thinks it's the greatest babyface thing that he's ever seen when after Onita pins Terry Funk and leaves the ring, but the timer's still going down, as it reaches zero, Onita dives back in and covers Terry Funk while the explosions go off. Um... You know, I think Jericho makes a really good point. I think that's a really, really beautiful story. Um, And I love how they tried to recreate that in AEW when when Eddie Kingston covered Jon Moxley during the exploding barbed wire deathmatch they had there. Obviously, we know how that didn't quite turn out when it fizzled, but the idea was there, right? And I think it's really cool that AEW tried to replicate that because I don't think we've ever seen anyone pay homage to like something like that uh, in a Western promotion before. Um, you know, the other thing that I was really cool and glad they included in the uh, episode was the Hayabusa versus Onita in the explode, exploding barbed wire cage match. Just saying these things just sounds insane <laughs> because FMW was insane. But what I didn't know, actually, which they talk about in that episode, was that Hayabusa wasn't really a deathmatch kind of wrestler at that time and that he was really out of his element in that match. Um, I had no idea, you know, because my experience exposure to FMW has just been like through whatever DVDs that I could pick up or from whatever I I could watch on YouTube as far as matches go. Uh, I never really knew much about the history of the promotion and I thought this episode of Dark Side of the Ring did such a great job talking about it. Um... You know, they covered a lot here in this documentary. Uh, A lot of violence was shown, but I think the hardest thing to watch out of the entire documentary was when they showed uh, Hayabusa's injury. You know, that that terrible, terrible fall he took um, that ended up paralyzing him and ending his career. Um, It's when he goes for a moonsault after bouncing off the second rope, and the way he lands on, like, his top of his head and the way his neck snaps back is just absolutely harrowing and terrifying to watch you know I think it's because we know how real it is and the fact that it really really injured him and hurt him um anytime we see injuries like that in the ring you know it's really really scary to see um you know I remember being at the um what was it called? The uh, first or one of the first New Japan shows that they ran at the Cow Palace in the San Francisco uh, in San Francisco. I remember watching Hiromu Takahashi versus Dragon Lee, and there was a botched suplex in that match. And Hiromu he landed on his head, and for anyone who follows New Japan knows it put him out for a really really long time. It put him out for over a year. That injury he broke his neck. He fractured his neck in that match. And he finished it. And I remember being in the building. And as soon as we saw that happen, you know, it was obvious that this was an accident and it wasn't supposed to happen. And the air was just sucked out of the building. All of the fun just immediately stopped right then and there. And it was just, you know, a really scary thing that I never wish on anyone to happen in the ring. And I never want to see again in person. And just seeing this injury from Hayabusa, you know, I'd seen it before on YouTube, but seeing it within the context of the documentary, uh, it was really hard to watch. And it really, you know, makes you realize that, you know, these artists, uh, these professional wrestlers, artists and athletes or whatever you want to call them, I think they're artists, really put their life and livelihood on the time, on the line every time they step in that ring. Um... So yeah, that was that was hard to watch, but you know they obviously had to cover it in this documentary. Um, I also didn't know at all about Arai uh, taking over the promotion from Onita. Um, I guess he was the ring announcer. Uh, he has a that very distinct ring announcer voice. And sorry about the fly flying around here, um, but. 
Uh, I had no idea about that, and it's just, just such a tragic story with what happened to him, too, committing suicide after taking out loans from Yakuza loan sharks, and then these Yakuza loan sharks then going after his family. It's like, you can't even write this stuff. It, it's crazy that this exists and even happened, and it's even crazier that it exists and happened within the context of pro wrestling, right? It's just totally nuts and insane. Um... You know, and by the end of this thing, I was left thinking a lot about the uh, the sacrifices wrestlers make, uh, thinking a lot about, like, storytelling and how it's done in Japanese-style res- wrestling specifically, and even more so storytelling and how it's done in deathmatch wrestling even today. And, you know, I think deathmatch wrestlers get a lot of flack uh, and a lot of hate, you know, saying it's just garbage wrestling or whatever. I disagree. I love deathmatch deathmatch wrestling as much as I love, you know, five-star Tokyo Dome matches. Um, uh, But, you know, watching this uh, really makes you realize, like, how crazy of a world pro wrestling is, how crazy FMW was just in general, and how lucky we are to have... uh, Promotions like AEW today paying homage to something that's relatively obscure. So I wanted to just sit down, talk a little bit about FMW today, talking about like how I discovered FMW as a kid, uh, what I think of FMW today as an adult. Um, I think I'm going to go watch the uh, Onita versus Hayabusa uh, exploding barbed wire cage match (laughs) after I finish recording this video. It's been probably a year since I've seen it. It's a great match. Uh, so much emotion, you know, and that reminds me too, you know, when Jericho says that, like, after his matches, Onita would just cry at the end of them, just, like, fully giving himself to the audience and how totally over that was with the audience. I think that's so incredible. You know, we don't see anything like that today at all. I kind of wish we did. You know, he was just, like, such an impassioned wrestler that had such a great connection with the crowd. The Hulk Hogan of deathmatch wrestling, for sure. Um, and, you know, I you don't hear about him enough, uh, honestly. And it's just so cool to see this episode of FM, of uh, Dark Side of the Ring about FMW. And I was happy to see Onita talking. He still just seems, like, so cool to this day. But in any case, uh, I went a little uh, longer than I had originally planned to with this video. I wanted to keep it pretty short as I'm pretty tired and I want to go to bed because tomorrow night after work is AEW Rampage and that's a late one. So that one's a little hard to recap. But in any case, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you all tomorrow night for AEW Rampage.